Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for Build with Mapbox 2023. I'm Chris Wong, and I'll be your host throughout Build with Mapbox. Build is a special event for us because it's an opportunity to reflect on all that we've been hard at work building at Mapbox and an opportunity to engage directly with you, our community of Mapbox developers, customers, and partners. We have a packed agenda today. We'll start with our keynote where we'll learn about the importance of having a location intelligence strategy and share some ideas for implementing one. We'll hear from customers and a panel of experts on what recent advancements of AI mean for your location intelligence strategy. Then we'll move to the breakout sessions where we'll deep dive into even more specifics. Finally, we'll close the day with Ask Me Anything sessions, where as build attendees, you get exclusive access to the people building Mapbox products. At the end of the day, our goal is to have you feeling inspired and equipped with knowledge about new ways to solve problems that you're likely facing in your projects, businesses, or organizations. We're really excited to get things started today with our keynote. I'd like to introduce you to our general manager of navigation and logistics, Garrett Miller. Thanks, Chris. And hello, everyone. Uh, can you all hear me? Am I coming through? I don't know if you can talk. Hear you loud and clear, uh, yeah. Excellent. Wow. Excellent. Uh, loud and clear. Cool. Well, hey, welcome to the second annual Build with Mapbox event. Uh, I want to thank all of our participants, speakers, uh, all the folks that made this possible. Um, thank you for all of that. And thank you for joining us today. Um, you know, Build for me personally is a really exciting event. Uh, I get so inspired hearing these stories that are going to come to life today uh, from our customers and really from the broader community that's harnessing the power of location intelligence to supercharge applications and businesses more broadly. Uh, you know, looking at our audience here, uh, first of all, it's so fun to see all the pins on the map from where everybody's joining. Um, and I know many of you are already familiar with Mapbox, but for those of you who are just learning, uh, Mapbox uh, was initially built as a way to make beautiful digital maps. However, today, I think it's important to recognize that we are so much more. Over time, now, over time with a lot of investment in our location data and platform, we've grown into the leading provider of maps, location data, and navigation technology, not only for web developers, but also for automakers, mobile app developers, logistics services, and much more. In fact, if you look at your phone, there's a good chance you're using at least one app that's powered by Mapbox. For example, maybe you're a fan of running and use Strava to plan and track your routes. If you're like me, particularly as we get closer to ski season, you might like to check the weather forecast regularly and love a good weather radar map, perhaps from the weather company. Or maybe you ordered groceries or dinner from Instacart, who use Mapbox to optimize their deliveries and allow customers to track their orders on the way to their front door. Or moving away from the phone, perhaps you've got a Toyota parked in your garage that uses Mapbox for its intuitive and distinctive infotainment system. Today, thousands of companies across hundreds of use cases and industries use Mapbox both in the front end and back end of their applications and operations. These companies and community members are leveraging location to accelerate their businesses and their missions. How are they doing it, you might ask? Well, with a comprehensive location intelligence strategy, which is what I'd like to delve into with you for the next 20 minutes or so. Now, Peter Drucker, a management consultant, educator, and author who made major contributions to both the philosophical and practical foundations of modern management theory, is often quoted as saying, you can't manage what you can't measure. Now, here's the thing. Businesses everywhere are measuring everything. Advertising effectiveness, sales, customer loyalty, engagement, time and applications, and much, much more. But here's the thing many businesses are missing something, and that something is location. Now, I like to think of location as both a lens and a lever, a lens to examine your business and a lever to improve it. <clears throat> Today, I'm here to talk about the transformative potential of a location intelligence strategy and how Mapbox can help take your applications to new heights. We're going to explore three pillars to form the foundation of a robust location intelligence strategy. Enrich, 
visualize, and personalize. As we go through each of these things, I'll walk, I'll, oh, pardon me, well, I'll share and walk, uh, although virtually, uh, with you some of the services we ship and how they can be used so that you walk away from our conversation today with some tangible examples of how you might approach this space. And it won't just be me. I'll also be bringing in real world customer use cases to help bring each of these to life. Let's start with Enrich. Every single business has data and enriching data with location takes it to that next level for actionable insights. Once enriched, you need a scalable way to import and host the data to make it easy to use across applications. Here at Mapbox, we've long invested in data as a strategic priority. How we source and create data, how we combine data, how we continuously update data, and how we ensure it is as recent, comprehensive, precise, accurate, and high definition as possible. Mapbox offers the tools to infuse your data with rich context, turning it from a mere collection of points into a dynamic tapestry. Let's take a look at how some of our Mapbox services support this pillar. First, Please stop struggling with messy addresses from manual inputs or patchwork of data formats. Mapbox's geocoding API effortlessly translates addresses into normalized structured data and includes precise geographic coordinates, laying the foundation for accurate and meaningful visualizations. Now, this next one I love because it helps you answer better questions. You ever wonder how many customers you have in the zip code 90210? Do you need another store in Montana? Mapbox Boundaries allows you to organize and bucket your data in a way that makes decisions and actions possible. After all, without boundary, boundaries, we're left with a fuzzy cloud of points. The Mapbox Boundary API allows you to define and work with custom boundaries, ensuring that your application respects specific regions or geopolitical limits. Whether it's city districts, country borders, or custom geofences, the Boundaries API empowers us to tailor our location-based experiences to the unique characteristics of different areas. Moving on to the Matrix API, we can effectively calculate travel times and distances between multiple points, providing a comprehensive understanding of accessibility. As an example, on-demand delivery companies can determine travel times between customers and their favorite merchants and remind customers how much time they save by ordering delivery instead of driving themselves. Now, this particular capability may or may not have saved multiple dinners at the Miller household. Um, particularly passionate about this one. The Isochrones API it enables us to visualize reachable areas from a specific point within a given time frame, aiding in strategic decision making based on travel time. Now, a retailer can generate an isochrone for every customer in their database, allowing them to easily determine how many stores or warehouses are reachable in a specified amount of time. But what does this look like to actually bring together? Businesses need a fast way to take data where it already is and enrich it with that location intelligence that we bring to bear. That's why we built the Snowflake native application. Many of you are using Snowflake to manage your business data already. Now it's easier than ever to enrich it with Mapbox. The Mapbox Snowflake native application enables users to access Mapbox services, such as the geocoding API and boundaries via SQL and the Snowflake platform. Now, anyone can normalize, aggregate, analyze, and visualize geospatial data with a simple select statement. By combining these tools, not only do we enrich data with location context, but we also ensure that applications are boundary aware, providing a personalized and locally relevant experience to our users and yours. Take Parkbee, a leading European tech platform for parking making underutilized off-street parking locations digitally accessible to consumers. Well, let's be honest, <laughs> searching for parking is kind of tedious and can be incredibly stressful. And that's why Parkbee bridges search data and technology with simplicity to help users focus on what really matters. And that's enjoying their time in the city without worrying about finding parking spaces. Let's take a look. 
Hello everyone, I'm Luca Lago, product designer with Parkby, and I would like you to imagine a world where parking in the city is no longer a nightmare. That's the world that Parkby is creating. Our platform makes it easier to find off-street parking spaces in urban areas for a stress-free parking experience. With Mapbox GLJS, Mapbox Studio, and Mapbox Search, we build Parkb to deliver a modern, interactive map experience right on your smartphone. Location search functionality is especially critical for the Parkb app experience. And with Mapbox, we can easily offer quick, precise search functionality, confident in the data quality and coverage that Mapbox provides. Building with Mapbox has had a huge impact for Parkb. We've seen a 30% increase in user engagement and conversion, and we've cut operational costs by half. Our users absolutely love the ease with which they can search, find, and book parking spots. All right, uh, awesome. Now, now that our data is enriched, it's time to bring it to life on the map. And Mapbox is not about just flat images. It's about the immersive experience of 3D, 3D maps that deliver stunning visualizations. You need to engage stakeholders, whether those are internal or external, with location insights that are easy to understand and highly engaging. It is vital to pre-process data, so it is optimized for high-performance visualization. And Mapbox Tiling Services has set a new standard when it comes to this processing. Today, MTS breaks data sets into millions of tiles so your users can download just the parts of the map they need. It can scale up to handle any size data set and process it quickly, saving your team months of engineering time and the ongoing overhead of administration. But until now, this has been limited to vector data, lines, points, polygons, which is great for a lot of use cases like bike rides, property listings, and service areas. However, raster sources like weather radar, images from satellites or drones, or high-density cellular network coverage information have been out of reach. But this changes today. We are thrilled to announce raster support for MTS. Now you can seamlessly integrate MTS to enhance your map with high-quality raster imagery and ensure optimal performance. Now, if you think back to this summer, uh, we launched the Mapbox Standard, a new approach to map styles that I am obsessed with. And I have to admit, I love the name because I think it truly does define a new standard of what developers and companies will come to expect from their maps. Now, Mapbox has always provided a core style of expertly crafted map styles for developers to build with. Think of crowd favorites like Mapbox Outdoors or Mapbox Satellite Streets but the new Mapbox standard style is something else entirely. We've taken years of experience and collaboration with Mapbox customers, folks like all of you, and combined that with inspiration from enhancements in 3D rendering technology in the gaming industry to deliver a highly performant and elegant 3D mapping experience that is one, easy for developers to build with, and two, improves wayfinding and spatial orientation for users all while still excelling as a canvas for that custom location data. And of course, Mapbox standard comes with our trademark performance. So it works on a wide array of hardware from smartphones to chips inside of vehicles. By combining these visualization tools, we not only present data in an engaging and informative manner, but also provide users with a visually rich and immersive experience that goes far beyond traditional maps. Now let's bring this to life with an example. Maps People delivers dynamic, scalable mapping solutions, in particular for indoor mapping with their Maps Indoor platform. They recently launched their new 3D version of Maps Indoor with Mapbox Standard. Let's see what this looks like. Hello, I'm Christian Christensen, CPO at Maps People, and we develop Maps Indoors, the leading indoor mapping and navigation platform that's built on Mapbox. Maps and Doors provide businesses with everything they need to deliver high quality 2D and 3D indoor maps directly into their own applications, bringing their customer spaces to life. We help customers deliver maps with speed and scale, simplifying wayfinding and ultimately increasing user engagement and loyalty. We know that the most useful maps are not just about the indoor world. 
Yeah. Customers often need location context outside and around indoor spaces to effectively drive business outcomes. By leveraging the new 3D Mapbox standard style, we seamlessly integrate the indoor maps with the 3D outside world, building a map environment that mimics the real world in ways that's never been possible before now. Fantastic. Now, our enriched and visualized maps are ready to take center stage. Location intelligence is more than putting pins on a map, even though that was really fun to do at the beginning of this session. It's about taking actions and changing the world based on intelligence. The personalized phase is where we integrate our maps seamlessly into applications and use them to deliver personalized location-based experiences to attract and engage users and equip all parts of your business with real-time location intelligence. Mapbox Maps SDK makes it easy to embed enriched and visualized maps directly into the application, creating a seamless experience for users. With Maps SDK, users can interact with the map, explore details, and plan journeys effortlessly. Now, enter the world of precision navigation with Mapbox Navigation SDK. By integrating this powerful SDK, we not only provide turn-by-turn -turn directions, but also enhance the user experience with real-time traffic updates, dynamic rerouting and clear visual and voice guidance. Now let's take a moment to dive into a real-world application of our location intelligence strategy framework coming to life. This will feature one of our customers, Decathlon, a French sporting goods retailer who is using location intelligence to both reach and innovate on behalf of their customers. Decathlon's success story is a testament of how Mapbox's suite of tools can transform a vision into a vibrant and engaging reality. Let's play the video. Hello, I'm Clémence Rombeau. I'm a product manager at Decathlon. At Decathlon, we're on a mission to make sports accessible to all. With over 1,600 stores and 100,000 employees, we develop affordable, sustainable products that everyone can enjoy. We've actually created an outdoor app called Decathlon Outdoor, which offers turn-by-turn -turn navigation on 40,000 plus trails. We use Mapbox for mapping and navigation in this app. Our teams collaborate closely to bring outdoor hiking experience to life. But we're not just about hiking. Decathlon is also a leading retailer of bikes and e-bikes, we're working on a major update for our Decathlon Ride app, which is powered by Mapbox, Maps SDK, and Navigation SDK. And Mapbox has truly been a game changer for us in helping Decathlon provide top-notch navigation experiences. Together, we're shaping the future of sports and outdoor adventures. So cool, so very cool. Um, so here's the deal though, right? I, I think we can go farther today in this era of rapid technological innovation and integrating AI with personalized elevates our capabilities and empowers us to create more intelligent and even more personalized experiences. At Mapbox, we see how the synergy of AI and location-based strategies reshapes our understanding of what's possible. It's not just about maps and data, it's about intelligence, adaptability, and a deeply personal journey for every user. This year, we launched Mapbox for EV, which integrates the vehicle's battery systems to monitor their personal energy consumption patterns, intelligently forecasting range, suggesting char charging stations based on real-time availability, and facilitating secure payment processing. This helps speed the electrification revolution by fixing what's broken and making it work for everybody by making navigation smarter and more location aware, not just in cars, but in scooters and bikes as well. Additionally, large language models have advanced rapidly, especially this year. You can now have complex natural conversations with AI assistants like never before. A huge area of potential with this new technology is navigation in the car, at a theme park, hiking, and so much more. Mapbox is addressing that opportunity with the launch of MapGPT, a location-aware conversational AI service that allows car makers and app developers to create customized voice experience capable of highly natural and actionable conversations. 
MapGPT is built on Mapbox data, making it the first AI system capable of engaging in in-depth conversations about real-world traffic, restaurants, landmarks, the road network, and other highly dynamic and context-dependent aspects of this world. It's powered by plugins that we call Actions that integrate with vehicle systems and third-party services to give MapGPT the ability to take actions on your behalf. The potential here is really, really exciting. And Mapbox is approaching this as a service provider, not a B2C app builder, because we want apps and vehicles everywhere to benefit from this technology. We want the delivery driver with a long, lonely day on the road to have a helpful assistant to chat with. We want parents in a rental car for their holiday to have one less thing to worry about when taking their family on a road trip. We want all of our customers to be able to apply the benefits of AI and GPT technology in ways that serve their users best. And we know that AI, just like maps, won't work with a one size fits all approach. So we're taking the same approach to AI that we do with the rest of our products and placing customizability at the core. That's why we built MapGPT to be fully customizable and modular. The possibilities are endless with AI. Now let's delve deeper into the practical applications and real world implications. Our next segment features a dynamic live panel discussion featuring guest speakers who can speak about the intersection of AI and location intelligence by delving into the evolving landscape of geospatial technologies. Without further ado, I'd like to invite our moderator for our keynote panel, Marina Smith, to introduce our guest panelists. Over to you, Marina. Thank you, Garrett. I'm excited to host this discussion about one of the hottest topics that we're all thinking about in the location tech space these days. One of the things I enjoy most in my role on the Mapbox marketing and social impact teams is to have thought provoking conversations with our customers and our impact partners. And today I get to share that with all of you. Our topic today is exploring what AI means for location strategy as well as the intersection of AI and location technologies more generally. Before I introduce our panel, just a reminder to please submit questions for our live Q&A time with our panelists using the Q&A function in Zoom. It's a little easier for us to keep track of than the chat. Um, you can submit questions at any time and we'll keep track of them there for the Q&A time. All right, so on our panel today, we have four guests who bring together diverse applied perspectives on this topic. Steve Atwell is the user experience practice lead at the Ordnance Survey in the UK, where he manages a team that designs and builds digital mapping interfaces. You may recognize Steve from his popular social media accounts where he shares innovative experiments in map-based user interaction. We have Brad Samuels, who is a founding partner at C2 Research, a firm that mobilizes technologies for digital evidence investigations in cases of state violence or violations of human rights around the world. Brad also sits on the Technology Advisory Board for the International Criminal Court, among other boards. And we also have Angela Navarro, our Head of Directions Services at Mapbox, who brings years of experience managing data teams from Mapbox telemetry data products through to quality assurance for our directions services. And we have Lucas Martinelli, who has extensive experience across the Mapbox platform from maps to data to navigation, and who is now heading the development of the new Mapbox Location Intelligent AI Assistant, MapGPT. So a big thank you to each of you for joining us today. We'll make sure that everyone's uh, off mute as well and ready to dive in. Okay, so thank you, Marina. First... Oh, hi, <laughs> hi, Lucas. <laughs> All right, let's dive in. So you each bring unique perspectives to this discussion. Could you each share a little more about how you've interacted with forms of AI in your geospatial work over the years, and in particular, how has this changed in the last year? Uh, Lucas, let's start with you. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's been a really amazing 2023 so far. Uh, Mapbox has used a lot of AI for map making. You know, like 
extracting buildings from satellite, um, calculating traffic, in search, um, learning to rank. But what really has changed, I think, this year is natural language processing completely changed for us. It's gotten very easy to do traditional NLP tasks much quicker now, which has really helped us in search. You know, we're we're able to now give better results, personalize more, better understanding. You can scrape much easier. So that's been really big jump forward in natural language processing. And then, you know, what we've seen else with MapGPT is voice technology. Um, we're now able to integrate it very directly with a UI and our context of map data, allowing you to build a better experience than, for example, uh, an Alexa does in a car because we actually know about map and navigation. And so really that whole trend of user interfaces has also been interesting. Once you have AI and context of where AI on edge, you can build much simpler user interfaces uh, where you can build them flatter, you get your actions done quicker. So it's been just fascinating this whole year of how much more productive we've gone and how much we were able to propel search, um, testing, localization, uh, thanks to large language models. Yeah, it's definitely been an exciting time inside Mapbox. Uh, Steve, how about you? How about your history with AI and uh, what's new this year? Hi, Marina, thanks. Um, my history is very short with it, with AI. It's kind of, uh, I've grasped this opportunity to get into this field from the development of the large language models. And what's been nice about that is, is that then I've learned a lot more about what's been going, in on, going on in my own organization um, because obviously there's been artificial intelligence, machine learning going on at Ordnance Survey for the same reasons that Lucas was saying just a minute ago about um, you know, feature extraction and understanding the data that we've got and 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 streamlining processes. Um, but I thought kind of being because my background is user experience and building mapping applications, there's kind of a question that we often ask when we try and elicit, you know, what what do you want this map to do for you to somebody who's asking us to build something? Mm. One of the questions we sometimes are we, we used to ask was what if you could ask the map anything, what would you want it to tell you? And that's all that's kind of stuck in my mind, especially with a particular conversation I had at work. And then with the advent of the large language models, the first the first thing I, I started playing around with really was looking at do they know anything about geospatial data? And are they are they geospatially aware? Not really. Okay, so how how can we how can we leverage that technology to try and make what is a very complex set of data for people that needs quite a high skill level to understand? How can we make that easier for our customers and our organization uh, to, to understand and get value out of? So that's that's where I'm coming at this from. Nice, a lot of potential there. And Brad, how about you? What's your history with, uh, with AI? Yeah, I mean, we're really working in the sort of fact finding reporting around human rights violations. Um, and so the stakes are high in terms of getting things wrong. Right. Um, so the, you know, our relationship to AI over the years has been this kind of oscillation between leveraging it to help us get through the deluge of evidence, you know, the videos, the photographs, the open source stuff, and to, you know, there's just more and more. So how do we begin to leverage, um, AI tools to even make the work possible in the first place to find the needle in a haystack, so to speak, um, on the one hand. So that's one way in which we've been kind of, you know, using it. And the other is actually an analytical work. And that's interesting. It's, it's a sort of like um, inflection point that keeps moving, you know, in the analytical work, it's really impressive that it's accurate 70% of the time or 80%, whatever it is, but that's not good enough for court, right? If you're talking about legal contexts, um, you're handing the defense uh, a gift, right? So um, this is kind of our relationship to it. It's really around questions of precision, accuracy, repeatability, and and its relationship to facts uh, and truth. Um, and so for anyone who's kind of really interested in that question of the kind of limits uh, and accuracy in relation to geospatial tools, that's the kind of space that we live in and where we've been testing things out and continuously observing rapid changes and, and also dealing with big bureaucracies that aren't um, used to changing so fast. 
sure that resonates for a lot of folks listening in. Thanks, Brad. Angela, how about you? Uh, yeah, I guess first I worked on NLP feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, it's been really interesting to see how that's evolving for sure. Um, at Mapbox, I've primarily focused on um, how we make sense of the location data that, that we have to improve navigation services. Uh, so I've worked with teams that are extracting attributes of the road network for better navigation from imagery, uh, extracting information from our telemetry data uh, for things like traffic and ETAs. Uh, I've worked on uh, the development of our Mapbox movement product, which if you don't know about it, you uh, can look it up. It's pretty cool. Uh, using our data for better routable points and, and things of that sort. I'm uh, very lucky I get to work with a very rich, large data set. Yes, I feel like, Angela, you bring some of the, the history of AI before it was large language models, right? When it's machine learning and other, other forms of the tech. Uh, so thanks for joining us today. All right, so for our first big question, from your point of view, what do you see as the biggest opportunity for the application of AI in the realm of location services and location strategy? Steve, will you start us off? Yeah, sure. Um, the, the, the thing about geospatial data is that it can be very very complicated and it's it has this it has this huge potential where there's a lot of it you can um there's a lot of it available but to make sense and get value out of that you know how how much effort is there involved in getting the data in the first place but once you've got the data you know to, to start deriving some kind of value and insight out of that so i think I think if if we can um, make that geospatial data easier to interact with, then we're going to help a lot of our customers. And certainly, Ordnance Survey kind of has a close relationship with government in the United Kingdom. So, and and a lot of our customers um, are government related customers, and they 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 get this data under a contract. And yet, you still have to have um data scientists you need to have um, technologists and you need to have people that understand geospatial data in particular and know how to kind of get from whatever the question is that needs to be answered right to the end so that's quite a long um process and uh it can often be quite complicated so i think just deriving more value more quickly and getting to answers more quickly um yeah by giving by giving artificial intelligence access to an understanding of our geospatial data um, can just derive that value for people so much more quickly. And then certainly in the early days, they'll get some way onto answering their question or at least educate themselves more about what's possible before they ask the final question, which is often something that happens to um, anyone who's doing any kind of geospatial analysis. Someone will come to you and ask you, that they want this answer and then you'll show them that answer and they say well no i didn't quite mean that answer actually i mean this one so you go around that loop again so even in early days where it's immature you might still like close that loop a bit more quickly and allow people to get somewhere and, and allow them to kind of almost do an mvp of their data before coming to you to then um, finalize that data or that answer for them yeah, there's lots of geospatial analysts watching right now who are like, yes, please <laughs> help me close that loop. I like that point. Thanks, Steve. Um, Lucas, do you want to chime in? What's uh, What do you see as the next, the, the, the biggest opportunity right now for AI? You know, I have a whole list that you build on what Steve said. I think, you know, the most straightforward one is really productivity and accessibility where you've seen at Mapbox, everyone building much more sophisticated tools uh, and I'm excited for how people build maps. You know, I see uh, college grads now building entire Mapbox apps within 10 minutes, um, you know, using things like um, ChatGPT and Copilot to do so and really excited how it makes it even more accessible for anyone to build, to build applications. And so for us as uh, geospatial builders, building more tools to enable that will help. But really what I'm really excited about is data. Foundation models today, no concept of geospatial data like Steve uh, shared. Um, you know, at Mapbox, we're sort of committed to, we have that data, 
we built that hard ground truth thing that you can't hallucinate on. And we, we integrated with foundation models. So that's huge opportunity for us. Um, it's something that few companies in the world can do because nearly no one has location data um, globally. Um, the other one I'm really excited about is voice technology. Um, you know, voice assistants and up until today have been pretty disappointing their adoption, but we work a lot on navigation and um, you can't focus on a phone um, or a side screen and tap a touch screen while you drive. Um, and with what's now possible with voice technology is someone like Mapbox that's really focused on driving can allow anyone to build a voice assistant that allows you to do context aware actions like oh, uh, finding a toilet as a truck driver while still overtaking someone um, or, you know, in, in the car, um, asking um, to entertain your kids, uh, like things we all expected from, from Siri and Alexa and they didn't deliver because they weren't deeply integrated. And then voice also allows us to build much flatter UIs. Um, sometimes you don't know how to turn off the HVAC. You don't know that in search you could order uh, a Starbucks coffee for pickup. All these detailed things, you can make much simpler UIs now and flatten it. So I'm quite excited how voice improves you, UIs and how it also makes it just safer when you drive, uh, uh, which personalization is another big topic with a few short examples, right? You could on device now predict what a person likes without ever sending any PII to, to a server. And I think that's really big. You know, at Mapbox are very privacy focused. We, we never have personal information of anyone. So on device running small models that predict what you like with not a lot of examples is now super possible and excites us. Then map making, another huge area. Um, <clears throat> one thing I'm really into is visual question answering, where you give an image and you can figure out what's in that image, um, not just with segmentation, but just asking questions. Um, scraping has been really big in map making, where it's now ridiculously easy to, to scrape thousands of websites, which has been great for our search. Um, simulation has been another big topic where we're having much more sophisticated testing now. We can simulate users and their behavior based on examples. And so that's really upped our quality testing game. And then information retrieval with search. I don't know about you, but I use Google very little at this point. Um, um, you know, you can get everything done with generative AI calling out. Um, and for us at Mapbox, it's been great uh, because like bolting on LLMs to our search has allowed us to really build very impressive results and get much higher velocity. Um, and so I think it's a new day for search. I think you, I think you see so many new companies, um, you know, threat, threatening the, the dominant player out there. Um, and at Mapbox, we have built one of the best geospatial searches and now we can rapidly improve it with LLMs. So it's been exciting. Now, if you're a builder, I would say really think on what you already do and how AI can help you double down and how you can change user experiences in a novel way. Don't just bolt on a chatbot, please, but really think of how, <laughs> how can you fundamentally make something easier for the user with AI? That's not just a chatbot. Nice. So a great long list from Lucas. I'm sure Lucas's teams are uh, hiring as well to produce some of these amazing <laughs> things. Thank you, Lucas. Um, Angela, what about from the kind of data side of things? What do you see as uh, the biggest opportunity right now for AI? Yeah, I'm a little hesitant to say biggest opportunity because I feel I go to sleep, wake up, and the next day somebody has done something even more amazing with AI. Um, it's just difficult to say, but I, I will say that I'm really excited by um, all the super deep customization that we're starting to see as a result of very targeted modeling. Uh, I work a lot with our navigation customers and there's hundreds of ways people are moving around the world. And you know, like car transit bike, it's just not enough. It's not granular enough. There's, um, it's been really interesting to start getting into the, the, the real nuances of each one. For example, are you carrying frozen goods or are you on a road trip or you're an e-bike or you're in a human powered bike? And, you know, each one of these things, um, each one of these different ways of move, of moving around the planet is, it, it can be really quite nuanced. And we're starting to see 
how technology can help us cater exactly to those particular use cases. And when you pair that with contextual awareness and really good language, I think we're, we're starting to see really, we lower the cognitive cost of navigating. It makes navigation safer. It makes the experience better for the driver. It makes the experience better for the passerby. So I'm, I am really excited for, you know, for kind of like how all of these things are starting to fit together. Mm. Yeah, that, that's a great point about just the incredible diversity that for a long time, Mapbox, we've been trying to allow that level of customization, but now the, the, you know, the floodgates are open in terms of making those models easier to create. And Brad, uh, what do you see from your world about uh, the biggest opportunity that you're excited about? Um, I think gen as a general statement, human rights abuses and violations tend to happen and thrive in darkness, right? In areas that are less documented and there's less access to. Um, and I, you know, if we start a project in New York City on suppression of dissent, it's very different than starting a project in Khartoum on suppression of dissent. Our baseline, our geospatial baseline is extremely different, right? And I'm excited about the potential for AI to close some of that gap. I, I know, you know, there's all caveats around ground truthing security and privacy questions for sure. And we can talk about that, but I think um, it's also fundamentally a question of equity, right? I, I think we should be able to pursue uh, our analysis um, and people that commit abuses of power, regardless of where they are in the world. And uh, it's really exciting for me to, you know, increasingly be able to kind of, um, when you need a map, when you need a 3D model, um, have that stuff available. And I think AI is gonna do, is go a long way to kind of, continue to populate um, these things um, and, and quickly. I think the other part of it, the second thing I'd say is that there seems to be um, some, almost like a collapse between two-dimensional and three-dimensional data uh, in the sense of, you know, <clears throat> marrying photogrammetry and LIDAR with 2D geospatial um, world and earth coordinates. And I think um, the ability of, AI to sort of facilitate that, expedite it, and kind of erase some of these, what feel almost like vestigial distinctions between raster and vector data, you know, 2D imagery, like, you know, a photograph right now is geospatial to me, right? So um, I think this is increasingly the case and that is where, you know, the what's online can be mined uh, to help populate, you know, the first part of the problem that I articulated, you know, it comes with, again, challenges, but I think it's, it's quite exciting and it's happening very quickly. So those are my thoughts about, you know, what's exciting about where things are going at the moment. Mm -hmm. and that's actually a great lead in for our next question, which is about some of those concerns or caveats or uh, maybe just implications that need to be thought through uh, with AI. So um, and I'm sure our audience is going there as well. Um, so for each of our panelists, for you, what is a concern or perhaps just a challenge that needs to be tackled that is top of mind about the use of AI in the geospatial context? Um, Anhala, would you like to start us off? Yeah, for sure. I, I, I'll share two different things that are top of mind for me. The first one, of course, I work with data a lot. I would say data quality has been a challenge and it continues to be a challenge uh, we generate a huge amount of data and the predictions coming out of the data are not always reliable so i would say always top of mind is to not get too comfortable and consistently evaluate retrain uh, you know uh, the technology is getting really good at tricking us into thinking that it is correct so i i, I keep that top of mind Mm, I would say the other concern, maybe more general, is, is centered around privacy. I think I would say at Mapbox, we have a long, well-established, strict privacy protection for our users. I personally have worked on this a lot, and I, I feel pretty pleased with where we are. Uh, but I'm not sure that the AI community as a whole is thinking about privacy as a top concern. And we see people interacting with AI, interfacing with uh, AI systems in all sorts of new different ways, sharing all kinds of personal information. And I think that uh, it's the, the, the introduction of privacy risks is, is, is pretty real. 
um, I do fortunately also see um, kind of like the consumer getting uh, much more um, knowledgeable and aware about their um, their privacy and how they can protect their own privacy. But it will be really interesting to see how how the topic evolves. I very very much interested in the privacy topic and AI. Mm. And that's yeah something that goes far beyond the geospatial aspect as well. Uh, great to call out. Um, Brad, looping back to you and some of the points you were you were starting to raise, um, you want to elaborate a little bit more about some concerns or challenges? Yeah, I mean, it's two sides of the same coin. It's really just a continuation of what I was saying before. I mean, I think tracking the relationship between the physical and the virtual is paramount to the work we do. Um, I'll just give an example. We recently worked on a case in the International Criminal Court where we were asked by the Office of the Prosecutor to build a, a digital twin of Timbuktu, the whole city of Timbuktu right for a whole host of reasons that i won't go into now um and nested within that model was laser scans and areas of greater interest so there was sort of um different levels of resolution right and different techniques of capture that were within one single register uh it's great because now the court <clears throat> is doing all kinds of it's opened the floodgates for sort of innovation and in how evidence is presented but we do have to submit a paper or a methods report which articulates exactly how everything is built and if some large portion of that becomes a black box and it's you know synthetic data it it's difficult if not impossible to be able to articulate at the level that you would need to um how how the the, the built environment was was replicated as a, as a kind of digital twin or you know in its virtual format um and i think so it's kind of like a tracking you know what's captured, you know, where that fault line is between, you know, let's say a building an object that's captured optically, LIDAR in one way, and how, how exciting is it that you can film the rest of the building, you know, with one photograph conceptually, but super problematic from a question of like truth and fact. So um, the nerfs, the sort of go see and splatting stuff is all stuff we're looking into and it's super exciting but we have to maintain our ability to describe you know the inputs and what went into building it and i think that is um just sort of an acute question in our case but i'm sure is a question that everyone everyone is facing in some way mm -hmm. you've got really strict kind of standards that you need to hit in in your context um, I know that truth is something that's on Lucas's mind a lot as well in the navigation space. Lucas, you want to tell us about some concerns or challenges top of mind? I mean, I, I agree with Brad, like synthetic data out there. I don't think we have a whole lot, but the more it gets created, think of websites with CEO optimization for POIs that don't exist or what, what you mentioned and images kind of filled in, imagery, satellite imagery being filled in. So we all have got to build really good synthetic data detectors. <laughs> Be very careful in why we allow sort of filling in gaps. Um, and, you know, if you go to large language models, for us, it's very important to catch hallucinations. Um, so foundation models have no concept of geospatial. So if you ask them to route you down, you get sort of convincing answers, but they're not right. If you ask for a restaurant, you know, you, you can get mistakes. So a map box, you've built this whole layer of validating, hey, <laughs> is an LLM saying what's actually ground truth um, and through agents looking up in our data what's ground truth and I think that's really important for anyone building um, and I you know what, what Angela said on privacy is really important at Mapbox we don't collect any personal information but you see all sorts of tools out there that spread it around I think we're lucky that location data isn't treated like that don't see much it LLM and chatbot spreading location data around, but so much PI gets from one service to another and another. And you know, for us, a map box did something absolutely paramount to us. We're so committed to never even know and uh, anonymize all data, and, um, never have any personal information. So we we build all these detectors everywhere to make to make sure. And I hope the community sort of does the same thing. Don't spread <laughs> privacy related information around in these services because it's become a whole lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, well, one more thing, because we work on voice, right? Voice and agents can invoke actions, like something can say, turn down the window. How we are dealing with that is, you know, when AI takes an action, you should always check, <laughs> this is what I'm going to do. Is that what you want to do? And 
that's maybe, you know, with a human interacting, that's not the case. You have sort of trust. You tell it to do something and it will do it. With AI, it always has to confirm that it's taking an action on your behalf. And that's also very, very important for us. Mm. Yeah, it's one thing when it's rolling down a window or changing the temperature. Another thing as we get into the world of autonomous driving and cars actually making more significant decisions for you. So uh, thank you, Lucas, for highlighting that. Um, and Steve, from uh, the builder's perspective, how about you? What's uh, kind of a concern or, or challenge top of mind? Uh, well, actually, it, w it wasn't something about building, but um, it's more about data privacy. Um, because I don't know if you're as old as me, you'll remember when Google turned from a really useful search engine to kind of this box that you post all of your interests in for the for the benefit of advertisers to target things at you. And <laughs> yeah, and and I think and, and I, I think there's a bit of a danger that people need to be aware. I've certainly in my personal life, I, this is something that I've. I'm going to be looking out for over the next few years is there's going to be a temptation, I think, with large language models and artificial intelligences to connect them to all of your data. And I'm talking about personal data at the moment. You know, um, if I want to understand, you know, what's going on tomorrow, what the weather's going to be, what what did I put in my Google document yesterday? What meetings have I got? Um, personal medical information, I might want, I might find that difficult to um, understand the terminology in that so I might be writing documents you know to, to help me to, to and, and have an AI look at that there's going to be not just in personal but also in in uh, commercial life this temptation to either uh, put all of your data in one box for an AI to look at or have the AI go out to all of your pieces of data and that's just something to be wary of because when all of that data is centralized or is available to something like that, there's there's a huge kind of risk of abuse. And we see it, um, we see concerns like this coming up outside of AI, maybe but just to pick something out of the air, something like building information management, where you're bringing all of the data from all these different places all into one place. Um, and I often hear concerns about, well, now, if the wrong person then gets access to that data, um, then that's not a good thing to, about your building security, for instance. So why does why does the plumber need to see where the security cameras are and things like that within your building? So there's a real kind of um, need to ensure that rights and permissions and security on that data is really tight. So as exciting as all this is, you know, just be, be careful when you see um, all of your personal data or all of your business data all in one place being looked over by a, a, an, an AI and who owns that AI and what are they doing with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, this is leading into our, our third and final big question as well. And, and just before we get into that, I'll, I'll encourage folks who are listening in, if you've got questions for our panelists, Put them into the Q&A box and we'll be uh, transitioning to live audience Q&A pretty soon. Um, so for our last full panel question, it's very clear from all the things that you all have shared uh, that exploring the potential as well as the complexities of AI geo innovation is something that we're all going to be working on and discussing for years to come. If you could share a call to action or say uh, an invitation to collaborate to the Mapbox developer community, which we know is made up of creative developers across hundreds of industries and different areas of influence. What would your invitation be? You know, how, how do you hope to see the Mapbox community innovate with AI and location? Um, maybe Brad, uh, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, for me, um... I think collective work on geolocation and chronolocation as a community could be fantastic. And but what I mean by that is, you know, the ability to quickly ascertain where and when something happened. You know, and I think there's a lot of work we talk about in, in geospatially in the static world, right? The the built environment, infrastructure, et cetera. Um, but I would also add to that increasingly the kind of ephemeral world of events. Um, and I think 
Um, it's incredibly important right now as, as there's so many sort of competing narratives, contested narratives. Um, we've seen it um, in conflicts around the world. All you have to do is cast doubt on something if you're a state power and it throws the entire process of justice and accountability into a tailspin, right? So I think one of the things that as a community we can do to kind of contribute to that, you know, addressing that problem is, um, you know, if there's a protest, if there's an event of interest, um, to try and be able to kind of quickly reconstruct what happened. Um, it's never gonna be possible to do a TikTok second by second reconstruction. It's always imperfect, but I think this idea that, um, you know, events are just too complex or complicated in the event of protest, for example, it's a very convenient narrative for people who are not interested in accountability. So it's about creating a baseline understanding of a of an event. And then I think taking certain narratives off the table that are uh, ideologically driven perhaps and, and getting to facts sooner. So um, I, I think just to bring it back to a simple point, geolocation, where did something happen? Corona location, when did it happen? And really thinking about that in the service of events and ephemera in addition to the built environment. And I, I mean, I love the, the power of that in the human rights context. And my mind also can take it to places with commercial applications too, right? If you are monitoring specific, maybe safety events um, on in, within your properties or you, you want to be monitoring, um, yeah, just kind of your, your industry of interest. Um, so yeah, time as well as space. Uh, Steve, how about how about you? What do you hope to see the Mapbox community innovate with with AI and location? I've kind of got a got a question about whether um, whether geospatial data can be the next modality that a large language model can understand. So by that I mean you might have heard of multimodal models where they started with just with text. And we've moved to text and images. So there's a relationship there where you can write text and it can understand and then it can look at a picture for you and interpret that and tell you back in language what that means. And um, if you take kind of uh, something like ChatGPT and take the uh, imagery modality out and put geospatial data in there, I wonder if that's... Um, I wonder if that's even possible. And it kind of goes to what Brad was saying about, you know, you've got words, pictures, the next things I, I hope will be space and time because it doesn't, they don't deal with space and time very well at all at the moment. So I think maybe looking further into the future, uh, there'll certainly be lots of effort made towards that because the experiments that I've been doing at the moment have been great at understanding data structures and they've been great at understanding what's in your data and interpreting what you mean by rather woolly phrases um, like I want to read a book and the, the AI can understand that maybe, OK, you probably want some libraries or some museums or or you want bookshops and things like that and, and, and then look through a data structure and understand translate your woolly language into into something that's that's structured and, and and it can and it can suggest to you what you should then be pulling out of the database um but when it comes to actually pulling the data out and showing that to a like these large language models it kind of blows their mind because there's so much data that they find they find a small amount of data okay to to interpret if you give it a weather report or a couple or a few shops but as soon as you start talking about the level of data that that we want to process simply having it look at that data and interpret it isn't enough and that's why i talk about having that data actually be part of the large language model as a modality that it can that it can think about rather than have to read and interpret if that makes sense so it would be kind of calling people to think about that and look out for opportunities where we can train the base models on these on space and on time, because I think that's where we're going to get a better able to compare documents, time scales, events that have happened and ask it questions about all of those things and answer. It's, we're not there yet, but I think that that's where we're going to be going. Awesome. What about you, uh, uh, Angela? What's what's your call to action that you would add on that? 
Mm, yeah, um, I would say I, I do truly believe that AI is changing the way we interact with the world. So if you have not worked with ML and AI, you should not be afraid to go and try it. It is technology like anything else that you can learn how to use. So don't be scared. Um, it's super fun. It's super powerful. And we certainly need creative and passionate developers working with AI, especially on the geospatial space. Um, so I hope that if you haven't done so, you go and um, get into it. I, I will pair that with something I tell my teams all the time, which is question everything because confirmation bias, both on AI systems and in humans is real and it is hard to overcome. Um, so something that I do think it's pretty important to keep in mind, but yeah, play with AI, question everything that tells you, but, but I'm, I'm sure people can build some pretty amazing things with it. Love that. Okay. And uh, Lucas, what would you uh, close this out with in terms of? I'll fire four again. Like I agree with Steve, do more research and experiments of making geospatial a true first class citizen in foundation model. Way more needs to be done there. Don't be afraid to try. Even if you haven't gotten deep, it's not too late. And it's, it's very easy to get tried and very rewarding. Three, do think about better user interfaces and how it changes the paradigm. Um, and that goes for voice as well. Think about how, if you if you had voice that's as smart as a human, what would you change in your application? So um, I'm excited about really all these areas. Fantastic. Let's see what our audience is excited and wondering about with our audience q and I see we've got several questions in here already. Um, feel free folks um, to add in additional questions. So let's uh, let's get started. Um, we've got a question here about uh, guardrails. So does Mapbox plan on putting guardrails with the introduction of AI into the platform? The worry I can see is already how poorly GPT models are being trained and the responses it delivers regarding geospatial operations is quite weak. So maybe this is uh, for, for Lucas or Angela. Um, anything you can share about guardrails, about how Mapbox is beginning to integrate um, GPT? Yeah, like I shared, like privacy wise, you know, very focused on it never even entering our systems. Lots of guardrails and barriers there. Hallucinations always have this validation layer that reasons if there or keeps it in check and checks it to ground truth. And actions, we need this validation layer, and AI doesn't do actions on. On behalf of you so you know at every layer in the stack we're adding these protection layers in between so you design it with this in mind but you also add hard protection layers that if anything ever were to go wrong that those protection layers would catch it so it's very much how we're thinking about it anything you'd like to add uh, -huh. uh i think lucas covered that but yes you know um it, it's certainly a challenge and we're being very careful on how we, what data we train with and especially with something like navigation of course we're very aware that um there's a sensitive aspect there because of the pri of the safety of the driver the safety of those around the driver so um i would say top of mind for the teams for sure absolutely um, now we've got a more general question for, I'd say, anyone on the panel who wants to answer. Um, how much are you using AI tools to write code for developing custom solutions or improving existing applications? Have any of you uh, dove into that, actually using AI to help you write code? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the last sort of few months, I've knocked out quite a lot of demos and ideas. Um, and I'm not a great coder, to be honest. I used to code many years ago. Um, and I couldn't have done half of the things that I've built, like the demos of extracting data from the Ordnance Survey's National Geographic database or automatically writing queries for OpenStreetMap data, things like that. There's always like the speed at which I can have ideas and use uh, GPTs for coding just functions for me most of the time is oh, I need I need this I need to pass this string in and I need this to happen to it or I or I literally can't 
I, I don't want to sit down and write from scratch a load of CSS. I'll just tell it what I want and I'll, and that will speed up the process of that. So most of the demos that I've done, it's been kind of 50-50 effort, really. Um, and I and I would not have been able to do those a, a lot of those demos without it, to be honest. Hmm. Yeah, and that loops back to a point Lucas made earlier about just the pace of productivity that we're seeing this startup with and the access into the world of building web maps and, and mobile it, maps. It's very, it's very freeing because it gives you, if, if, if someone has an idea, they can get something out quite quickly. And and I, I think, to be honest, the things that that I put together are only concepts. You would not put any of those into production environments. I always say to developers, don't put me anywhere near any of your production code, please. Um, and I would say the same about that. But it enables you to have ideas very quickly and realize them and do, do proof of concepts very, very quickly. So I really appreciate that. Maybe I just want to add one thing, which is um, I think a lot of our conversations has been about sort of this moment and looking forward, but we've been recently working on some projects which allow us to look at historical data much differently and using code to kind of go back in the historical record with radar sat imagery and sentinel imagery in particular. So combining like multi-spectral signatures with form finding algorithms to um, crawl back in time and, you know, answer questions that are um, relevant today, but involve a better understanding of, of history. And I think, you know, the data sets are so uh, robust that we couldn't spend the time doing it manually, obviously. And so this allows us to get that work done. Yeah, different. Yeah, I would really say if you've already, you know, been using tools and programming, it, it adds to you. But what's really exciting is that you're getting hundreds of millions more developers. Uh, someone posted, I, I know how to wield GDAL now. And that's true for everything, right? Um, uh, you, if you're unsure how to use the Mapbox style spec to do something, you can now just go create it. I think that's super freeing. And this is exactly why you shouldn't be afraid to try building things nowadays. It's pro it's the best years now to build something, even if you've never built before. And I love when I see, for example, people just from college that have not at all any background in computer science now building apps, um, because that entry hurdle is gone. Um, and I think that's the really exciting piece. Very nice. All right, we've got some uh, more specific questions here in from our audience. Um, we've got one about pedestrian navigation. So how can AI help with pedestrian level navigation? Does Mapbox or any of the other panelists have interest in LLMs creating pedestrian directions that are more intuitive for people, including people with different abilities. For example, walking through a park and the user gets the direction, turn right after you pass the large, large statue, um, or for someone with visual impairments, turn right when the sidewalk ends. Um, any, uh, any thoughts on pedestrian level navigation or accessibility more generally? I, 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 I mean, I yeah, I mean, this is a little related to what I was saying earlier about contextual and, and, and very sort of like customizable uh, ways of, of moving. Uh, I can tell you, I, I am really bad at understanding how many 300, uh, you know, what our um, feet are. I have no idea. I never know when I'm driving. So um, starting to see things like you know, take a left at the next blue building or take a right after what our KFC or what our, um, you know, sort of like contextual information you have is is one of the things I'm really, really interested to start seeing. And this is what I, what I meant when I said it really is cognitive load, you know, like if I can see a blue building down the street and I know that that's my turn, my brain has sort of like the ability to to sort of like parse a lot more of what's around me than if I have to try to figure out if that's 300 feet or 150 feet because I actually have no idea. And, and I think you can sort of like expand that concept to something like of course accessibility or other different types of, of navigation, pedestrian, bicycle, bicycle and things of that sort. So yes, this is this is one of the things I would say I'm really excited to see how it evolves. And it ties back to what Steve said, got a bolt on, right? Geospatial data on top of foundation models to understand where you go. But then I'm also a big fan of visual question answering models where, you know, you can do 
given a picture and a video, you can ask questions about it and relay to someone that's that's impaired. And there's really cool startups out there doing that as well. Um, And Steve, I see your mic is off. Was there something you wanted to add? Um, I think that um, just on the general, uh, on the general point of pedestrian navigation, you're going to see with the new technologies that are coming out, us not looking at our phones and us communicating more with devices through natural language and natural language processing and using these LLM models to understand what you mean and what you want back and then taking the data, taking um, uh, taking navigational data, if you take a JSON object of some directions and throw that at um, chat GPT, it will read them out to you um, if you ask it to in, in a completely natural way. So, and that can take the data and say, oh, this is what you want to do next. So, for, I mean, that, that strikes to the heart of the question about um, visual impairment and under, and also it allows us to kind of free ourselves and have headphones on and, I don't know, 10 years down the line, these glasses will have a, a little um, a little screen in them when uh, Apple managed to shrink them down that small. <laughs> and we'll be wandering around with, with um, an LLM assistant helping us helping us move around um, in a much more natural language way that we'll be, uh, we'll be communicating with it and it will be communicating with us. So yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely coming. All right. All right. Well, we've got time for one more question. So I'm going to kind of combine two of them that have some similar themes. Um, so the first question is, you know, now that we are all mostly about AI, do you think we'll start to see a neglect on the non-AI aspects of development? Um, and then a related question about concerns from an individual career perspective for folks working with location tools, are there things we should be worrying, worrying about being replaced or prepared to sort of upskill um, and uh, prepare for changes in our careers? I think I think change is coming. Definitely, you could ask the same question about the advent of the internet. You know, in certain in certain industries, if you were in media, television, news, uh, then your your business model before and after the advent of the internet has completely changed. I mean, look at Netflix. All of all of your media now comes through the internet, and so that's completely changed. For media companies but people are still creating media um uh and so try and think about um you know the advent of artificial intelligence as, as enabling you to do your job better really there will be some disruption you can't you can't get away from that this is going to be an incredibly disruptive technology just like all technology has been the printing press was incredibly disruptive and it disrupted a lot of things around the world and changed the world completely. Um, the internet's done the same, and there's a real there's a real sense going around that artificial intelligence is is on the cusp of doing that as well. I'll just say that I think there's part of this trend is in increasingly interdisciplinary work teams that are, you know. In one space, you know, our, our team has computer scientists and geographers and architects and filmmakers and curators. And so I think the good news is like the foundational sort of interest and understanding of geospatial geospatial tools positions you really well to ask the right questions, right? To stay conversant in a way, even as the tools and the technology change. And I think in some ways that's more important than anything else. Um, so I think we'll need. People like that will be badly needed um, as, as the tools continue to change so that we can ask the right questions and point things in the right direction. And, and, and going on from that as well, you if you um you won't have to know how AI works and like be really nerdy about using the latest AI technologies in a few years' time, just like now to take advantage of the internet, you don't need to know how to write a web page or be interested in TCP IP networking. 
it's just going to enter into all of the pieces of software that you use every day. You know, if you're a marketer and you're analyzing customer sentiment on your new product, the, the software that you use to do that is going to have um, have AI capabilities built in to help you do that job as well. So don't feel, you know, that you have to like get deeply into AI and how it works, but it will be coming to software near you soon. So. Indeed, there's no no escape from it, but it's there's there's definitely positives and upsides to all of this. Um, where we are at time, just Anhalar Lucas, any final closing words that you would like to add? I'll just well, say, the, uh, you know, it, the, to the person who asked that question, AI is a tool just like everything else, and it will be very good at certain things, and it will be less good at other things. So, I I believe there will be like, I don't think we will neglect non-AI aspects. I think we will integrate non-AI aspects with AI and, uh, you know, it'll be, it'll be good. It'll be good. Great. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much to our panelists for joining us today. I'm going to hand things back over to Garrett to wrap up our keynote and send everyone on uh, their next steps. Thank you so much, panel. Wow, very cool. Uh... Big thank you to you, Marina, and to the guest speakers. That was an amazing discussion. Um, so a quick recap of where we are. We covered the transformative potential of a location-based strategy and how, with the help of Mapbox, we can take your applications to new heights that you've not yet reached. We explored three pillars that form the foundation of a robust location intelligence strategy. Enrich, visualize, and personalize. With all that being said, I'd like to pose a few questions to each of you to keep in mind as, as we wrap up uh, this, this keynote section. Specifically, what is your location intelligence strategy? How are you using location today and where do you want to go? The rest of today's programming will provide additional opportunity to ponder and answer these questions for yourself and for your business. As we look ahead to the rest of Build, you'll get the chance to learn everything I covered and more from our Mapbox team. I'd encourage you to please join a session after this keynote and attend and ask me anything for a lively discussion. Uh, big thank you to all of our attendees for being an integral part of this exploration. Your presence and engagement add immense value to this conversation. To our customers, your trust and partnership inspire us every single day. Your innovative applications and solutions using Mapbox drive us to continuously enhance our platform and innovate on your behalf. And a heartfelt thanks to you, the broader community, developers, enthusiasts, and visionaries alike. Your ideas, feedback, and collaborative spirit move us forward, shaping the future of location-based experiences. I'd encourage us to see today as a starting point for further exploration and innovation with location. Together, we can continue to enrich, visualize, personalize, and empower, creating experiences that resonate with users on a profound level. Thank you.